Hey there, so in this video, I wanna go into my latest meditation retreat where I had what I am defining as a slow ego death. Now, if you have tried psychedelics or if you practice meditation very rigorously, you might know what I'm talking about when I say an ego death. An ego death is essentially where your sense of self, your sense of separation with the world completely dissolves. Some people interpret this as meaning that there is no self whatsoever that the entire notion of a self at all is completely empty of any sort of metaphysical or existential truth value. Other people define this as being the true self. So when you dissolve like this, when your sense of individuality and personality starts to become baseless, starts to be experienced as being empty, some people define this as coming into contact with the true self, quote unquote. I'm not really going to be advocating one way or another. I just want to report on my experience because I think if you have the conceptual understanding of what an ego death is, you, inev you will basically have a roadmap for where meditation ultimately leads. I honestly can't remember, but um, I've heard meditation be defined as a slow ego death over time. And I think that really does justice to what the practice actually entails, a type of practice that's not just oriented towards feeling good or performance benefits, but a type of practice that is centered around the process of spiritual awakening and enlightenment, which is why I meditate. Before I get too into the weeds of this video, let me know what you think about recording outside, whether this is a good idea, a bad idea. Um, I figured since the first video leading in into this one was shot outside, I might as well continue the theme. Uh, I kind of like it, it's really nice outside, so I thought it would be cool mixing it up, but just let me know what you guys think. I felt like the retreat itself was broken out into two phases. The first part was this very deep purification that took place, where I was just busting through or being busted by limiting beliefs, fear, anxiety, tension, stress. It was actually, um, not an enjoyable experience whatsoever. That was the first half of the retreat, really the first 75% of the retreat. And then the second half, or last 25% maybe, was an opening up into this ego death-like experience where I finally was able to actually settle in and experience uh, just that lack of sense of uh, separation between self, other, and world. The actual purification process itself, I've talked about this before, um, in the context of emotions, but I found that in this retreat in particular, it wasn't necessarily that my emotions themselves were being purified, quote unquote. It was more that I was coming to terms with just the general suffering of being alive. So one of the big themes in Buddhism is that life is suffering. That's the first noble truth that the Buddha declared after his enlightenment. And I've never really understood what that actually means. Like, what does it mean that life is suffering? That feels like a very outrageous claim, a very um, a matter of fact and a deep claim, but I've never actually understood what it means from an experiential point of view. But on this retreat, there was a particular experience where um, a particular meditation sit where I was just sitting and um, wrestling with this mental uh, chaos, essentially, thoughts, popping up constantly, agitation, anxiety, but also a lot of physical body pain was coming up as well. And there was really nothing to do but just sort of to accept it. And in the midst of all of this suffering, essentially, the boredom, the distraction, the just sense of unease, um, it, there was this really interesting opening where it felt like I was, um, like my entire emotional system just opened up and I realized that uh, there is a deep suffering that is affiliated with living life. Like there is this innate struggle associated with just surviving on a daily basis. And um, it's not to say that you can't feel like happiness or joy or pleasure or enjoy any of that. It's just that there is this struggle that comes with the territory of being a, 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 a separate, isolated being and surviving on a daily basis. And it exists at an, experience, an experiential level that is extremely subtle. It's like 
it's difficult to point to unless you have very serious um, meditation practice under your belt, but the effort that it takes to just keep going on a daily basis, never mind the fact that we are constantly fighting in a capitalist system that demands that we work 40 hours, that demands that we pay bills, that demands that we have this like every man for himself attitude, never mind all of the cultural societal conditioning that we might suffer from, but just the mere fact that we're existing at all brings on a certain level of suffering that is cannot be uh, ignored when you start entering into territories of deep practice. So I was wrestling with this and I saw like in a flash just how much suffering I experienced on a daily basis and particularly how much suffering I experienced uh, was experiencing in that meditation retreat. What's interesting though is that as we confront this suffering, both in a retreat setting and just in general practice, as we confront this uh, innate intrinsic suffering affiliated with our existence, this starts to purify the mind. We start to be able to accept harsher and harsher realities, particularly in the case of the body discomfort, I started to just be okay with the physical pain, like my knees, my hips, my back, my neck, all of it was just extremely tense and tight, but that was okay, that was totally fine. I started to like purify in a physical sense, my body started becoming more pliant and accepting of the sitting. But more importantly, the mental aspect of just being able to sit with that, there's actually this like boiling like effect. When you boil water, you are in a sense purifying the water. You're adding a shitload of energy, a shitload of heat to that water and it starts to boil over and purify. Meditating does the exact same thing to our, our mind and emotional system. And when this happens, at least in my experience, I've found that it's incredibly purifying when you go off the meditation cushion. When you start living life, you walk and experience life, experience relationships with others, experience the world through this clear lens of mind and emotion. So eventually on the retreat, I was able to like finally sink in to a more stabilized situation after this really painful like six, seven days of just nonstop um, uh, painful meditation. <laughs> And you know, it, just on a side note, it's really interesting that it turned out that way because my first retreat was nothing but beauty. Like it was just this wide open, spacious, beautiful experience. It felt like I had a lot of healing of trauma that occurred and it was just blissful, honestly. Like it, it, I really couldn't tell you that it was challenging. And when I got done with the retreat, I felt this sense of like, man, I could just keep meditating and not go back into everyday life. In fact, I kind of wish that I could do that. But that's not how the second one was. The second one was this extremely um, agitating journey that I just wanted to escape from for the majority of it. So I say all that just to say that essentially um, even when we have experience under our belt, even when we consider ourselves maybe a little bit more advanced on our own path, uh, that's not to say that meditation is always going to be easy. There, is, there are going to be sessions that are filled with suffering. There are going to be sessions that are filled with agitation, stress, anxiety, uh, pain. And that's okay, that's just part of the path, that's just par for the course. And in fact, there is, like I said, a purifying element that is associated with being able to face these things with equanimity, with acceptance, with peace, and perhaps even um, love. So actually loving our pain away, loving our suffering to death. So all that was the first half, first 75% or so of the retreat. I, time starts not really existing on retreats. Uh, it's a weird experience. So time gets a little loopy. Um, so what happened with, with the ego death? Well, before I start going into what an ego death experience is like, let's first take a moment to define what is the sense of self? What is this thing, this individuality that we experience on a daily basis? With um, meditation, and particularly with the meditation uh, technique that I was using, which was Vipassana meditation for those that are interested, it's, a, it's called insight meditation, um, we can start to observe what this self is actually composed of. So the sense of self primarily is composed of physical sights, so you see your body as a phenomenological uh, perception of the visual space. 
you hear yourself speak, that's another component. So there's physical sound affiliated with the sense of self. You identify, like right now I'm kind of identifying with the voice that's speaking. And then there's also mental imagery. So you might notice that even when you're speaking, like even as I'm speaking right now, like I can see a very subtle um, mental image of my face and my mind's eye. Like I kind of see myself visually speaking, even though I'm not looking at a mirror, I'm not looking at my face. So there's a mental component of the self. There's also mental talk. I'm sure that everyone who meditates is familiar with that one. Uh, so we hear ourselves speak and that's sort of our sense of self. And then there's our emotional system. We feel emotions. Uh, so there's really like five main perceptions and perhaps more flavors and subtleties to each of them. But these five perceptions I found to be what compose the sense of self. So with these five perceptions that are going on on a daily basis, there's an identification with these that creates a sense of separation. There's sort of a mental conceptual mechanism that's going on that creates this sense of self. As we start to see, mindfully observe these sensations, they start to untangle themselves. You start to be able to just see your body without having to identify it. You start to be able to experience mental talk without having to identify with that mental talk or mental images of, of yourself without having to identify with those mental images. So we start to literally untangle and unblock the sense of self. And when you start to observe that moment by moment, not just these five perceptions that I talked about, but our entire phenomenological field of perception and existence and reality, when we start to see these, that all of these are impermanent moment by moment, like every single second your perception, your perceptual field is shifting and changing. When we start to get very present and are capable of stabilizing our attention on this fluctuating nature of our experience, what is the self? There is no objective self because the perceptions that are tangled up that give sense and rise to this self we see them as impermanent and we also see them as not us we see we start to get into the mindset or into the orientation of witnessing them without identifying with them so you combine that witnessing with the impermanence with seeing that with every single millisecond of existence every bit of your perceptual field has shifted it's subtle it feels solid it feels consistent but nothing is the same moment by moment um, there is no self and you start to see that clearly and the more deeply that you see that the whole thing basically just burns itself apart so this ego death was the slow ego death was essentially an opening up into a way of experiencing reality that does not have any sort of identification associated with it so by the end of the retreat rather than feeling like a separate individuated self there was just experiential phenomena there was just experiential phenomena i mean <laughs> there's nothing there <laughs> like there's just nothing there and so this begs the question um one, if things are constantly changing, what is the substrate out of which existence is occurring? Like, when you start to see your, for, let's take the visual field for example, when you start to see the, the fluctuations, the fluidity, the spaciousness, the impermanent flux of every single tiny microscopic bit of your visual field, where is it coming from and where is it going? This is a really good inquiry to contemplate during your meditation and you'll start to notice and open up into emptiness, which is um, it's not just a Buddhist concept, it's a concept in all contemplative spiritual, uh, spirituality. So even like contemplative Christianity, uh, uh, Taoism, Zen, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, Advaita Vedanta, all of them really. Uh, Emptiness is a big concept and you start to be able to experience that emptiness. But also, if you're not this sense of self, what are you? And so that's a really interesting question. What are we if we are not a self?
And so now just to kind of recap, you know, what, I'm, what I've been going through as I've reintegrated back into um, living life regularly, do I feel egoless? Um, it has lingered, actually. What's interesting is you, you really don't have to have such a strong identification with a self to function in the world. What's interesting is that a lot of this can just happen on autopilot, uh, very spontaneously, very unpreplanned. It's amazing how intelligent um, the energy that runs through us, <laughs> which is really ironic that I say that after what I just said, but the energy that runs through us, that gives us life, that grounds our ex existence essentially, it's very intelligent and um, it can act with a lot more spontaneity than what we're used to. So as you dissolve your ego, you begin to be able to operate at a mode, at a level that is completely spontaneous with its expression. Another interesting facet of this egolessness experience that you eventually begin to cultivate the, the more deeply that you meditate is that it actually allows and gives the space for our individuality to flourish. So what I mean by that is ironically, the less that we identify with who we are as a self, as an individual human, quote unquote, the more that we are able to express our individuality and uniqueness as a human. It's like somehow this weird paradox that when we can get out of our own way, when we can stop thinking so self-referentially, when we can stop getting caught up in fear and suffering and our monkey mind, um, somehow that opens up the ability to, ex to express and articulate ourself more effectively in the world, to act more effectively and to love more deeply. I hope this experience was useful for you. Um, I hope it somehow inspires you to go on your own meditation retreat. I would highly, highly recommend that you sign up for some kind of meditation retreat, some kind of silent meditation retreat, whether it's for three days, five days, 10 days, 30 days, doesn't matter. Uh, you're gonna learn something no matter what, meditating at a, at a rigor and an intensity that you're not used to. And I guess just the last thing that I would like to say is that um, the deeper that you go on this path, the more beautiful that life becomes. <laughs> I don't know, I guess I just want to end it on some hippie shit, like it, life really does start to open up and, and I think the depths of this practice, what it can bring you, it, it's, it's uncommunicatable, it's inarticulate and it's grandiosity. I mean like there is not a more transformative practice that you can embark on and, 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 and do on a daily basis because if you think about it, like our minds are the filter for reality. In a sense, our minds are constructing reality. So when we consider the fact that meditation is creating this very deep psycho-spiritual transformation um, within us, it's acting directly on the mechanism that creates our reality. So there is no more powerful tool to change the way that we experience the world, to upgrade the way that we show up and behave than meditation. Like meditation is the skeleton key for unlocking compassion, beauty, love, uh, focus, concentration, creativity, open-mindedness, um, and true inner peace. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that it was helpful in some way, shape, or form. Um, if you have any questions, comments, please uh, leave them in the comment section below. If, you have, if you've gone on a meditation retreat, please share that. Uh, not just for me, but anyone who's watching the video, that will help them as well, like sharing your reports, that helps others, that helps you integrate your own experiences, so share them. Uh, and I will see you guys in the next video. Until next time.